my dad, uh, a man called Michael Kwan Flynn, he came from uh, Newtown, which is just outside Kilmac Thomas, and he came from a farm. And it was almost a, a scripted thing where there was four children. One was a doctor and one was a... Uh, one was got the farm, of course, and then one was a teacher, and then there was my father, and he was actually put into the priesthood, or recommended for the priesthood. I won't say put into the priesthood, but he subsequently left it after six years, six or seven years in the seminary when when he met my mother, and uh, she was from Abbeyside and grew up on Mary Street in Dungarvan, and uh, that was it really. And then they they got married and they spent time. Their first business. Well, I, I kind of like the story of somebody just jumping over the wall, you know, when he sees a woman. And uh, it, anyway, it wasn't for him, but he subsequently remained quite religious all his life. Anyway, the, their first business was in Carrington Cross. He went to be on to be a pharmacist in, in um, UCD. And then pretty quickly, he worked in a couple of places. I, I, my, my older sisters are brilliant at filling in the blanks. I'm the youngest of eight. And uh, but he set up a business in Carrick Macross, his first business of his own. So it was Flynn's Pharmacy in Carrick Macross, and I have some lovely photographs of that time. Um, really, you know, it, I suppose it would have been. It definitely was in the fifties, and then they came back to Dungarvan to set up Flynn's Chemist in nineteen fifty nine, and I was born in nineteen sixty five, uh, in Molly Queely, a nursing home up on O'Connell Street, up by the old cinema, and I grew up over the chemist in the square. Uh, where there used to be a boy's room, a girl's room, a mum and dad's room, and that was it. And there was, eight, as I said, there was eight of us, but never really all at the same time. It was when you're the youngest, the, the eldest ones have gone off to wherever they're going to be, you know, teacher training school or wherever they're gone off to. And then, so there was still the boys, three boys in uh, an eternally uh, smelly room at the back of the house overlooking the Cumber Mountains. And, uh, and then the girls as well, which is always a prettier and nicer smelling room. And that was it. And we were just all crushed into the building. It, it always amazes me. You know, the houses that everybody has now, you know, they're just bigger and roomier and much more expansive and much more ambitious. And But I wasn't even the youngest. Uh, I, I, I wasn't even from the smallest family in my class. There was another man, a friend of mine called Martin Hulan. He was one of 11. And he was in a tiny terraced house up on uh, just around the corner from the square, really. And uh, like it's amazing. What what I won't say what people put up with, but the the expectations were very low. You know, kids were just crammed into the house. Parents did their best, and we were kind of feral in a way. We used to be out in the square all the time, and kicking ball and down the key, and they didn't know where we were, I suppose. And I definitely know this because I was told by my elder sisters that you know my dad was really strict with the first few and then he kind of not that he gave up but he just got worn out i suppose particularly with the boys and i was the 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 youngest and i got away with blue murder i totally did i had parties in the house left right and center and they were kind of they were just shrugging and look he'll be fine and not that they didn't care of course they did but you know by the time number eight comes along you're kind of going how many dinners can you cook and cooking is what i do for a living uh, obviously and uh, you know, funny enough, the food in the house was pretty awful, uh, because quite simply, I, I I am now really sympathetic to my mother, but quite simply at the time I was I was a like a lab a lab rash for nineteen seventies experimental cooking. You know, anything that could be opened with the scissors, you know, instant mash and fray bent off steak and kidney pies and, uh, you know. I it was it was it wasn't great to be fair. Everything was boiled. And my our favourite dinner actually was on Fridays always, and we used to call it chicken mush, and uh, yeah, it was really tasty actually. But it was a chicken crammed into a pan with loads of vegetables and boiled to be Jesus until the meat came off the chicken and like crept along the bottom of the pan, and it was really tasty, but it was fairly grim. And when I went to London when I was eighteen to to pursue my dreams of becoming a chef, because naturally, you know, my my leaving cert was that uh, glittering that uh, I was going to go to UCD or TCD or something, not. Um, you know, I, I encountered loads of French chefs who really used to annoy me because they used to tell me of tales of the wonderful food in their house and their that wonderfully or not so wonderfully arrogant French way of, you know, how the mother used to prepare the chicken and they used to have this amazing food. And I'm kind of going, OK, fine. I used to live in bourbon biscuits for the last year of my life, I'd say, hence my, my ample waistline. But I have lovely memories, I, I, you know. <clears throat> Going to school in the Christian Brothers, which was two minutes away, I think I used to get up at about 10 to 9 
And uh, my older, I got this habit from my older brothers because their breakfast used to be the bottle of milk that was on the doorstep. And they'd slug it down and then off they go to school. So breakfast wasn't a thing in the house at all. Like we just move off to school and that was it. And then, of course, on fair day, you know, which wouldn't happen now, there were t- horses tied and ponies tied and donkeys tied to the, the, the guttering outside the, outside the chemist. And you'd have to weave your way through the animals to, to get to school and hopefully your shoes would be clean on the way. It, it was really, um, you know, primal is the wrong word, but it was really sort of not something you would see today. But yes, this probably stopped in the 1970s where the fair moved down to, I think the, it was Quans into a field there. And I, funny enough, I kind of missed it. Or maybe that's just, you know, the old part of me talking and I don't really miss it at all. And tell me, <coughs> that was great. <laughs> Just uh, the uh, you go right back again. To your mom. Yeah. She was from Abbeyside, you said. Well, she was born in Abbeyside, and then they moved to. What's uh, her family name? Power. Really unusual in Waterford, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, I married a power as well. I mean, there was just powers everywhere, and she was a, she was a great woman. I mean, she used to. Uh, of course work in the shop it was very much a family business and and you know we know what that's like because myself and my wife Maura work in our own business so you're all in it together but she was very glamorous uh, I recently my sister recently discovered this little uh, it, it's called uh, I suppose negatives found in a rusty tin and she found this old rusty tin when she was clearing out the chemist because it's now closed it just closed last year after a fire not a huge fire but it was I suppose a moment in time when my sister and her husband, my husband, her husband worked there for 40 years with barely a holiday. I mean, it was entirely illegal. But the man used to just go away for uh, days here and there. And then Mags, my sister, used to just go off on her own every now and again as well. But the commitment to the community was always a really big thing. You know, if you're a chemist, you need to be open, you need to be there. Um, So they just decided to close the chemist. And it was a big deal because... You know, obviously, when your father starts it and your mother starts it, you, you, you there, there were concerns. What do we do with it? But their kids didn't want it, and it's definitely okay to say we don't want this to be a millstone round our neck. Let's live our lives. So the chemist is closed, but in the back of the chemist there was this rusty tin with negatives in there. And my father used to be an amateur photographer. You know, I always remember in the dispensary the camera took pride of place, and he didn't do it so much when I was younger as when. He did it when, you know, the older kids were younger. Uh, but anyway, in this neg- in these negatives were, it's just a, a moment in time. It's a time capsule. There, there are times when they were in Carrot Macross uh, and it stretched through to, I suppose, 1959 and 1960 to when they came to Dungarvan first. And my mother was on the beach, impossibly glamorous with a flowing skirt and, uh, you know, her makeup perfectly done. And I was thinking she's on the beach and she's really done up. But she used to she used to really look after the Max Factor side of the makeup side of the business. And my father used to be, you know, the the farming side of the business because it was very much uh, a farmer's chemist. And, you know, I used to there's words that used to stick in my mind, scour and hoose and, you know, problems with animals. My father used to have very, I suppose, um, a priestly way about the way he dealt with people. And uh, he was a very, I, I'd like to think he was a cherished pharmacist and he was very dedicated. But um, my mother was, was I suppose, the, the glamorous side of the business and, and she loved all that. And she loved dancing. She loved going out and she loved, you know, she was in the ICA and she had loads of friends and she went on trips. And my father was definitely quieter and more contemplative. And um, I think I got a bit of both. Off, off, off. I, I still love dancing inappropriately. It's, uh, yeah, a bit sad to watch, but I still do it, yeah. I can hear, what was your memory then of running around the square when you were, when you were very young? Like, what was the shops that you like going into? Now? Well, I suppose the closest shop was, um, uh, I'm going to start. I used to be left outside the, the chemist in a pram. Because it was okay to do that then, Obviously, hopefully on sunny days or, or you know fine days at least. But uh, and people used to kind of come along and cuckoo at me, and I'm not saying I was gorgeous, but I did win a couple of baby competitions in my time, I have to say. But next door, straight in front of us, was Paddy Foley's, a pub that was there for for years and years and years. The the owner of that, Paddy Walsh, he was my grand uh, my godfather. So he was he was the most generous godfather ever. You know, you can be lucky or not lucky, but between bars of dairy milk and, and, and money, you know, he was always really generous. So that was the, 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 the first shop, or the first business that was, it was all about business people around, around the chemist, sorry, around the square naturally. 
you know, then there was Creed's next door. He used to own a, a shop called Delaney's for shoes. And then beyond that, you know, there was a the plumber's. And then beyond that, the most important thing was uh, Tommy Powers, which was where I used to go and get my father's tobacco. And it used to be a shop at the front and, and go get ham and bits and pieces for the shopping. And at the back of that was a pub. Of course, I never saw the pub, but I used to go in there all the time for, for messages, uh, you know, pop over across the road and get us that. And then, you, you know, I also used to have to go down, you know, down when he wanted special tobacco, down to Mary's, which is ironically the pub that um, I started off cooking in. So that, that's been a kind of connection through my life. But I, I remember the people in the places around the chemist. The, when we used to be treated with a Coke float or a Fanta float, we used to either go to um, the, the Enterprise or the Beehive. And there were upstairs premises, cafes. There used to be loads of cafes. And upstairs premises, and we used to just on summer's day be taken over by the girl who used to mind us. There always seemed to be a girl who used to mind us. I mean, there was a girl called Kathleen that was with us for eight years because her parents were so busy and she was living in the house as well. Where she fitted, I don't know. Obviously in the girls' room. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the shops were all very, you know, quaint and dainty and rustic. And of course they would be. It was the time. I suppose we're talking about uh, very early, 1979, 71, 72, something like that. And we would scoot around all the streets. You know, there was a, an amazing cobbler uh, down uh, down on Church Street, street around from here. And the smell of leather used to be amazing. We used to bring the shoes down there to be mended. Um, you know, what really struck uh, me when I got a little bit older, there was a brilliant fish and chip shop called Sheen Rhines down Main Street. And it had sawdust on the floor. And um, it was very basic, but it had the best fish and chips. And we, when Dallas uh, came on telly first, I remember it was Tuesday nights or something, we always used to have fish and chips watching Dallas. And it was my job to go down and get the fish and chips, you know. And just, I suppose just the, the sweet shops, there was a place called Maggie Dalton's. We used to go and get things called Peggy's Legs. There were honeycombs or blackjacks. And, you know, I was forever eating sweets, of course. I was a chubby little fella. Uh, never good at sport. I was the last fella to be picked for anything. I was kind of, I was like a mercy pick, I reckon. Feel sorry for Flynn. We'll pick him. He can stand in goal and block the ball. But it was it was good crack. We great fun. And there was, you know, I, I, I very much uh, had a very close friendship with my friends, who I'm still very close to. To this day, we go off every year. You know, I know them since I was three or four. And we go off every year to uh, some capital city and make a fool of ourselves, you know, inappropriately. And uh, <clears throat> But it's good, you know, uh, who has friendships for 45 years plus. It's a really cherished thing. Although we don't see each other all that often in between. But we hang on to that thread. And, you know, Abbey's side was you know, was where the posh people lived. Even though we came from, ironically, even though we came from, I suppose, a, a professional family, we we didn't, we did not look at ourselves that way at all. You know, there wasn't a lot of money around the house. I mean, there definitely wasn't. I suppose there was just so many kids and, you know, businesses struggled. And But Abbey Cypress, where the doctors lived and the dentists lived, and it was funny that we never saw ourselves in that bracket at all. Whereas, in fact, other people did. And we used to go over there for... Uh, I don't know, you'd go to discos. Oh yeah, when I got older, discos was a, was a big thing. I was not totally committed to school and that is the understatement of the year. Uh, one time I actually spent a week up in the attic until until uh, the Christian brothers came looking for me. I used to creep down the stairs and then when nobody was watching, creep up the stairs again, all the way up the flights of stairs up to the attic and spend the day listening to, well, I, I didn't have any music, but just reading and sleeping and dreaming and then I'd come down the stairs again for lunch and then come up the stairs pretend I was really loudly come in for lunch for my steak and kidney pie or whatever was going or chicken mush I did that for a week until I got rumbled my father was mad um, you know he had high hopes for me actually he wanted me to take over the chemist he wanted all of us at some point to take over the chemist and then he gradually came down to me and there was nothing happening and I'm sorry for that you know but it wouldn't be, have been my thing uh, I used to spend summers from when I was small unloading boxes and, and sticking prices onto, you know, Cal Paul and whatever there might be, Dr. Martin, dog tablets. I, I remember these various brands. Actually, there's a photograph in, in that box, in the negatives of, of, of you know, there's uh, rat poison sitting beside baby food. 
<laughs> and I think there's no way that'll be allowed. So things have mightily changed. And, you, you know, I remember I used to get two pence for, uh, you know, when, when I was going back again, I suppose a little bit, two pence for a treat, maybe, I don't know once a week or twice a week or something. There was never loads of money, but it was enough. You know, we always used to be kind of out and about. But I was, from an early age, I was a TV addict and I kind of still am a little bit. So when the TV came in, I'd have to be scooted out of the place. You know, I, I, as soon as the telly would be on, or you remember RT and RT, well, certainly on RT2 wasn't there, but it used to start at five, six o'clock in the evening, I think back then. But I'd be like glue, glued to the screen and I'd have to be, on, on fine days, he'd have to throw me out and out on the street and just play with your friends. But we'd always been knocking around. I mean, living, we used to live in each other's houses as well. You know, I used to, Borina Troas, this row of houses that overlooks the Conniger. And I used to spend loads of time down there with my friend Hammy. And then Hooley was a fellow up the road in Western Terrace. And then Crocker, uh, uh, again, I was spending all my time in his house, to, much to the annoyance of his mother, I think. She was kind of thinking, does he have any home to go to? He's eating all my food. I was just thinking maybe the food was better in his house than mine. So, you know, just up and down the streets. And we knew that there was a place called Scanlon's, Scanlon's Yard, where the car park is now, just off Mary Street. And that used to be where we used to pretend to be cowboys and Indians. And it was all wild and overgrown. And we used to go in there getting sticky backs and firing them at each other and just be lost in there for days. And, and gaddies. Um, I've always thought about showing my children how to use a gaddy but then I thought better of it you know they, uh, it might take my eye out or something like that it's bound to be a casualty if I show them how to use one of those so and and swimming swimming was a really big part it's coming as I talk about it funnily enough it's coming back to me there used to be a brilliant outdoor swimming pool where the lookout is now and during the summer and of course I'm one of those people who says summers were way better back then but they you, they kind of were and we used to spend all day every day down there on fine days and I used to be a really good swimmer and you know I remember that the type there's a guy I can't remember the name of the guy but I remember letting the water in an old man I remember the diving board and just all the family actually were really good swimmers because that's where we spent our time and then every record I remember the Bee Gees when it came out in 1978 uh, Saturday Night Fever I remember that you know everybody listened to Saturday Night Fever down around the pool and all the kids used to gather around and so it was just it was actually just really a lovely time and uh, you know even though again I, I, I stress that money kind of never came into it nobody needed a whole load of money and there wasn't you know I remember getting packages from my aunt who, who was a nun in London packages of clothes and I, and I stress we didn't necessarily need them but I was kind of forced by my mother to wear like purple jeans. And because I was chubby, she used to have to cut a, a V out of the back of it. Have you ever seen that? Where like you, you sew in an extra bit just so you can tie your, around your waist. And I, I remember wearing those once up to school and like the lads took the piss out of me completely. And I said, right, ma'am, I'm not wearing those. I had a, a big... Um, a big meltdown over that so but you know things were definitely simpler I mean they had to be complicated for for parents and families and all that because they were you know just going through life as well trying to feed and manage their children and try and make sure that they went to college but about college there seemed to be no pressure like that you know the pressure I certainly didn't feel pressure in school I should have done um you know but the whole I suppose um you know I, the feeling that you had to make it to college otherwise you didn't make it that definitely wasn't there I mean so therefore I had a very casual approach to my leaving cert any exam I ever had I had a very casual approach to which is I suppose it just meant that I'm I, I wasn't academic I've always been a really good worker but just not not academic and uh, but when you know the years went by you know I mentioned discos we used to go to discos uh, you know down on Kill uh, in Strably, everywhere we could go. White Church, of course, was famously brilliant on a Sunday night, which wasn't great for Monday morning attention span in school, naturally. But we used to love going to discos. And I got myself a Honda 50, which I felt like a king. You know, I was the, one of the only few people with transport. I think myself and Hammy got a two Honda 50s and we carried the other two boys on the back and we'd always head down to kill. And like, you know, there wasn't much drinking, actually, as it happened. You might, you might have had a little bit, but... Um, it was kind of not as strict back then as well. So we would kind of be like night riders riding around the place on, on our Honda 50s and then into school again the next day. And it was kind of, we looked forward to the weekend all the time. And, 
but it was innocent stuff. It was all totally innocent stuff and, and totally country orientated. And do you know when you were small then, just in the way there was, there's, you mentioned the swimming pool, but yeah. you know, say the leather factory yeah. and the co-op. Yeah. I mean, do you remember going over to those places and looking in or playing around around us? Always, always. I mean, well, the thing about the leather factory, of course, the tannery now is where the leather factory was. And ironically, we opened up, we're 20 years old this year. And the, le- the last of the leather factory only closed in 1995. And we opened up in 1997. And the transformation was really quite remarkable. But when we used to cycle around here, but really kind of avoid it. I remember coming down this lane, there used to be hides either side of the lane and then dripping I don't know what to call it other than juice it, we would call it juice and it stank and we used to really accelerate going down this lane down to the lookout into the fresh air of the lookout and uh, you know you couldn't bear to be down this lane actually but yes we used to be down here down the mills down the quay where the apartments are down the quay uh, now they were all uh, grain mills and we used to be in there we used to climb in and just explore all around the place the castle of course we used to uh, be down the castle all the time trying to bring girls down there from the mercy We're forever kind of trying to chase girls and trying to bring them down to the castle d- during our lunch break and um, that was all around our, uh, that was on our minds but I suppose we were teenagers after all and then where else I mean absolutely we used to go out to the apple farm we used to go stealing apples um but Dungarvan wasn't as built up, of course, I and mean, it was very easy to access the country. Um, you know, there was a place called the Mills out, out uh, two miles outside town. I mean, there was always every day we were kind of going, where will we go? What will we do? Will we cross that stream? And um, will we walk over to the... Now, we, well, we never really walked. We weren't allowed to walk over to the Cunningham because of the tides naturally. But we used to, when it was very small, the boat used to be going from the lookout to the Conniger, and the Conniger has a very big uh, part in my memory of being small growing up in Dungarvan. Again, on those beautiful sunny days, we used to go over on the boat and bring picnics, all of us, and there was this one particular dune there that seemed like a, a huge thing back then. And I went walking recently, and of course it's not huge anymore, which is a combination of my memory, but weather, you know, it's been weathered. And I was kind of looking at it thinking, feeling a bit sad, because, you know, it was like a bit of your childhood taken away because I remember standing at the bottom of the dune and, and thinking, how am I going to get up to that? And then we used to just run down and roll down and all that kind of stuff. And then we go in and have cool pops. We used to call them cool pops. You know, they call them Mr. Freezes now. That's all we ever... There was nothing in chalk ices, I suppose, if we were lucky. And cones. Cones were, you know, if you're thinking about food, they were part of an Irish summer as well. And like... Sometimes I don't know that all this nostalgia is in me, yeah. but I suppose when you start talking about it, it opens up. And just, you know, you mentioned about the disco music coming in. Yeah. Would you, would, would have been, like, growing up in Dungarvan, would, would have been kind of the tradition of Irish music, was that, how was that looked on by the young people? Was that kind of, like, that's Did, old people's stuff? It kind of was, it kind of was a bit old people's stuff. I, I mean, we used to go out to ring every now and again, but it wasn't something we listened to. It was definitely... 80s music you know from 1980 on music became a really big thing and then there were mobile discos being set up everywhere so they might be in a parish hall in Kilrossenty say for instance one weekend and we'd always go there and figure out how to get there and there might be you know somebody might be driving there might be 10 kids inside in the car close to I mean they really would to be squished in and like sardines I mean obviously not advisable but this is what we did um, but yeah, music w- was a big thing. I, I, to the extent that when I got a bit older, maybe 15, 16, I had a huge record collection and there was always parties in my house, you know, because my elder brothers would, the ones that were still there, they'd be putting on the Beatles or the Stones or Leonard Cohen or bring girls over. I have very fond memories of, of the parties that we had. And that actually got me into music really early. When you listen, when it's in your house and music was always played, and my parents used to listen to Jim Reeves, and my mother loved ballroom dancing, and so it was it was a very musical house. And practically all my brothers uh, played music, you know, between the guitar, and they're all really good musicians. So it was always about kind of a bit hippieish, really. You know, uh, my eldest brother had long hair, and he was there playing the guitar. Girls all around him, and I was kind of thinking, okay, that we I should learn the guitar very soon. But uh, yeah, it was it was just great fun. And tell me, how did you end up becoming interested in food? Because I mean, given your your what you said about your mother and her cooking and all that, 
I mean, and it was probably a very weird thing for boys in those days yeah. to kind of gravitate in that direction. I mean, obviously there were chefs around, but... Uh, how did you end up in Well, food was n- never really part of the radar, although I will say that we used to love, um, there was a great place owned by the Flynn's called White Church, out about 10 miles outside, in Kappa, about 10 miles outside town. And any time there was a family occasion or just a treat, we'd go out for Sunday lunch out in White Church. And I still remember the dishes. You know, there might be pork and a whiskey cream sauce or a lovely volivon. It was just, it, it was a cut above. It was really lovely. And the environment was really lovely. And my father really loved it. <clears throat> And he also loved seafood. So he always had a little bit of seafood in the house, but not that it was ever cooked in sort of any fancy way. You know, we might have uh, smoked haddock and onions and milk and that kind of thing. But when he went out, we might go to a Hearns in the blue moon. Um, he'd have something really nice with seafood as well. So how the cooking started was, uh, I used to bring the lads back to the house after we came from Kill Disco on a Saturday night. And, uh, you know, my mother used to be fairly forgiving, to be honest with you. And I'd bring him in, I'd cook him up a fry. And, and we'd sit around, not for a long time, but I started cooking. But the real change was actually, I did all these aptitude tests when I was doing my leaving cert, you know, for the ESB. And considering that I can't even change a plug to this day, that is really ironic. My wife does all of the DIY in the house. And I'm good at, you know, I'll do hoovering, I'll do washing, I don't mind. I don't do DIY, famously. But I remember going to various factories and what am I going to do with myself? But anyway, I ended up getting a job in Mary's on a false scheme in 1982. I'd just done my leaving cert, which, as I said before, was spectacular. And I got a job. I walked into a kitchen as, as a commie chef and I said, I'd give this a go. And I remember it was 30 euros from false and 30 euros from pounds at the time from the boss of Mary's, a man called Michael Duffy. But this is where I think... I was lucky because there was a man in in the kitchen called Paul McCluskey and he had trained with with Paul Bacuse in in France and he was a a brilliant chef. And I just walked into this place and uh, I thought, what the hell is going on here? You know, there's gratin dauphinois and rack of lamb and veal marengo was a dish and I just started tasting all these things and it was like... And I, I loved because, as I said, I'm not an outdoorsy person at all. Um, I love the warmth of the kitchen. I love the temperature of the kitchen. I love the camaraderie. I love the flavors. I love the pace. And this is something that's not for everybody. I mean, the pace of a kitchen is like, you know, it's like that. So you need to kind of be able to cope under pressure and you need to like the environment. And I just walked in after three days or two days or whatever. Or one day I went, something going on here. I like it. And But I was fortunate to be with the man who really liked teaching as well. And he was teaching me good stuff. And he was teaching me stuff that I never saw before. It was just like my mind opening and my taste buds opening. And the curiosity in me just really burst into flames. It really did. And it was like it was like an epiphany. And I was very lucky to find that because subsequently, you know, I mean, modeling wasn't a, a career option. There was there was lots of boxes not, that, that I couldn't tick. And I was lucky to... to, to find this and I immersed myself in it although I was only there for a year and uh, also being really honest I, I, my father was disappointed that I, I wasn't academic that I didn't try harder and that I couldn't take over the chemist my sister rightfully ended up running the chemist um, but what I did do is that I decided if I'm going to be a chef I'm going to be a good chef I'm going to be the best chef that I can be and I'm going to make my father proud. And this is the truth. Um, so in Ireland at the time, there was, you know, the, the food scene was limited. There was a man called Sean Kinsella in Sandy Cove in Dublin. And I can't really remember too many other places. I mean, that's all we'd hear about. There was no, there was no culture. And I don't care what anybody says. There was no culture of progressive food. I mean, there was nice food as in apple tarts and jams and scones and all that. And nice cakes. But, you know, I, I wanted to go to London and I also kind of had enough of Dungarvan. I, want, I, wanted to, I wanted to just leave. It was 1982. It was pretty grim. I, I described the summer months. The winter months were different. It was cold and dark and grey and different. And, you know, I wanted the bright lights. So I had a brother over there, Decky, and I went over to a, year, a day past my 18th birthday. I went over to uh, London to him to stay for two weeks and just went into a job centre and just got a job in a couple of local restaurants. But in the meantime, uh, I ended up writing away. I bought a Michelin guide and I wrote away to all the, the Michelin restaurants in London. 
and after a year I got a job at the Rue Brothers but I was rubbish and they were it, it was a real hard French kitchen uh, you know they're amazing people they're what they've done is amazing but the particular head chef was just I was just too green and I remember I was still living with my brother down in Epsom and getting the train back and an early train in the morning you know work didn't bother me that was part of the deal Um, but I remember having to sleep rough twice in Waterloo station and then go back into work and you know nobody offered a bed and that still bothers me you know and I just thought right okay this environment here is is too harsh it's not for me It's, it's kind of beating the love of the job out of me um, it was a place in Covent Garden, um, but I applied for another job in, in a two-star, uh, one of only two, four two-stars in, in all of Britain and Ireland, and I ended up getting a job there as a commie chef, and I stayed with that man through five restaurants, a, a man called Nico Le Dennis, um, through five restaurants, I stayed with him for nine years, but at the age of 23 I became his head chef, which is quite remarkable. Um, you, you know, I'm not saying I'm remarkable, but I just put my head down. And I just loved the whole food scene and and I loved, I was intrigued by it. I still am intrigued by it. Again, uh, I stress I was lucky to find it. And, uh, you know, I've been trying to do as as good as I can ever since. I mean, that was Michelin star food. Uh, I didn't, I didn't and don't particularly want to do that. I wanted to have food that was more accessible. So, you know, long story short is in 1993, I, I came back to Dublin, got married, ran a place in Dublin for four years, didn't want to live in the city, started looking around the country, came to one of my friend's weddings. We were all dancing like madmen. I said, I love this. And why don't I put my, all my life savings? This was, the, this was my judgment on putting my life savings into a building, but found this building. And, uh, you know, myself and Maura discussed it. Didn't do a business plan, didn't do anything. There was a derelict factory behind here. This is up for rent. And then there was derelict cottages in front of me. You know, I always say, if you go to Dragon's Den, <laughs> if I went to Dragon's Den back then, all I'd hear is the roaring laughter as I descended down the stairs in shame. But we did it. We opened it. And I have never worked in as quiet a restaurant in my life as I have my own. You know, we opened up, as I say, 20 years ago. And uh, the first uh, summer was good everybody you know every we, we had a core of support absolutely but it is still a small town and it still took nearly four hours to get to dublin it was before motorways so it took you know without going into it too much it took effort and resolve and you know uh, a bit of luck as well in the shape of uh, ring college there was a lady called um uh, patsy murphy she came down her daughter was in ring and we got chatting i can talk as you can here and we just had a good time you know we just she liked me she said will you write a piece uh, for the Irish Times about living in the country and what I feel very strongly about when I opened the tannery is that I wanted to be you know I wanted to be relevant in my own hometown and it was all about D4 it was all about Dublin and it wasn't about the country and I wanted to be in the country doing something good so you know I said to her what am I going to write about and we were lucky to meet friends uh, Eunice and Edmund Power and loads of other friends and we used to end up going to parties in their houses and I used to write about the reality of the day not in a gloomy way but in a positive way uh, you know about how we used to obviously be 20 years younger we used to work our asses off and then we'd have parties and that would solidify friendships and we made lots of new friends as well so along the way you know I became the food writer for the Irish Times for three and a half years then and then there was cookery books and then there was tv and it kind of just you know it just came upon like that there wasn't a, a master plan and then people were coming to tra- to traveling to eat with us and then they were staying in local b and b's and we said well why don't we buy a building and put people into it so we did that and then we did it again and we put a cookery school in there and you know we, we've won restaurant of the year three times we've won cookery school of the year three times we've you, you know i'm i'm dogged and determined I'm as dogged as the day that I left for England but I'm just a bit older and I'm no I'm not just sure that I'm wiser so I have teams of young chefs that uh, work have worked with me through the years successively but you know I still Dungarvan has changed immeasurably uh, and I'm very proud of that and uh, you know what's happening now with the green is of great importance because now people are opening cafes as opposed to the recession closing places there's nothing more 
down heartening as when you drive through a town and places are closed. So what I see now is rejuvenation and hope and, and inspiration and innovation and entrepreneurs coming out of the woodwork. And this is fantastic. And because I, I have always believed that, you know, the more the merrier, people will come to a, to a region and a locality and a town if, it's, it, if it works together and be attractive in a, in a, in a, in a complete way not just the tannery down in Dungarvan, there's way more to Dungarvan than that. And do you think that there's a sense of people working together? I mean, <coughs> the Germans were, were, like it is a small town, and it is a, yeah. uh, you know, and it's a small town of, like, it, one end of the county, and, you know, the city, yeah. the main city is the other end of the county, but mm. do, you, do you get a sense of Dungarvan people coming together, working together? Well, well, to be honest with you, um, I think human nature comes into play there because it's human nature. If you're not busy, you're going to want everybody to come through your doors. But if you're doing well and you're full and you have no space and you have, you know, things are looking good or you're not offering what people want, you know, then you recommend people. And that's the truth of the matter. So by bringing more people into the place and having more, just more visitors, it's all we've ever wanted and, and, and a bigger population in the town, people are more likely to be busy and therefore they're more likely to be magnanimous. And I think it's just when you have your own bills to pay, of course you're going to look after your own and it's not so easy to work together. But, you know, we've been working, you know, I suppose we're involved in the, the, the Waterford Food Festival for a long time, for 10 years now. And... What's always been really important to me is that, you know, the connections that I've made over the years, along with loads of other people who have voluntarily worked with this, they come in, we get written about in the Irish Times and the English Times. And, you know, I suppose to keep our neck above the parapet in the sense that the people notice you. So that's what we have to do. People talk about Kinsale. 20 years ago, if I moved to Kinsale, uh, it would have been a lot easier. I'll be frank with you, um, because they had a ready set up tourism industry. I would just be doing my thing. Uh, but really what we had to do here was two jobs. We had to bring the people down and then we had to make them happy. So, you know, we are definitely working together more now. Uh, and I hope to continue that way because with the success of the town and and, and Waterford in general and the Greenway, uh, I mean, then people, you know, should and will say, listen, Johnny around the corner, he's brilliant. I mean, we do anyway, but I'm just saying from the honesty part of of, of the point of view that you know if you're not being able to pay your bills uh you have to take every person into your business that you can because you need to pay your bills yeah. just two little things that you mentioned you're the, the original man who taught you with mary's mm. what happened to him paul mccluskey went off to open a restaurant in waterford called mccluskey's it's kind of i can't remember the street but it's um it's just off the 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 front there uh, by the reg, just around the corner by the reg, and he had it for a number of years. Really, really good cook, and I still, much to his embarrassment, I think, not that I've seen him very often, refer to him as my mentor, my original mentor, without a doubt. Um, I mean, he used to even give me driving lessons, you know, everything. Uh, so, you know, th that love. I I suppose I started off with that cosseted environment <laughs> and then I went to the opposite environment in Covent Garden in London where I had to sleep rough to get my job done but I found a kind of halfway house in the end and you, you got it what I was really determined to do is build up skills that I could use later on but Paul then subsequently went on he closed the restaurant became a, a wine manager for Super Value and I think he's, he's definitely retired now okay. and then the other thing you didn't mention is how did your mum and dad meet you said you said he was a dad was a kind of trainee priest. God, that's a very good question. And, and your mom was. What was she doing? Where did they meet up? Do you know? I'm not sure, and I'm ashamed that I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it could have been a dance, but I, but I actually don't know. I mean, as I said, she was she was a really good looking woman. She was very glamorous. She would have caught his eye. There's no doubt she caught his eye. I mean, he was he he was always in love with her. You know, they didn't have there was rocky peers in the man in their marriage that we all remember as children. But, I mean, he was always in love with her, and she was always glamorous. Okay. Um, thanks very much. Well, I think that's a cover of those things. Yeah. So thanks very thank much. Thank you. Not at all, guys. T pleasure. And thank you. Look at it, Don